Today, we're going to talk about a serial killer who never paid for their crimes. But before we get started, welcome to True Crime with Maneater. If you love all things true crime, including missing person cases, cold cases, and just the strange happenings of the world, you've come to the right place. Be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss a video upload. Let's get started. Starting in April of 1971, six girls from the ages 10 to 18 were snatched from the DC streets. The girls had always been strangled, oftentimes they were sexually assaulted, and then they were discarded by heavily traveled roads. Three of the girls were raped, one was sodomized, and one of them was so badly decomposed that they couldn't tell what happened to her. It was believed that the murder of these six girls were the first serial killings in Washington and the assailant would become known as the Freeway Phantom. Around 2 p.m. on May 1st, 1971, children playing in a grassy area along Interstate 295 behind St. Elizabeth's Hospital had stumbled upon a body of a young girl. And when they saw the body, they flagged down a police officer. Police were sent to the scene of the crime, while other officers were sent to the neighborhood that the girl lived in. They wanted to find out from neighbors and friends and family what the girl had been doing before she went missing. They would soon learn the body of their first victim was named Carol Spinks. Carol was described as a seventh grade girl who was incredibly shy. Carol had an identical twin and they loved playing double dutch and jacks with her other sisters. And she had some really amazing hula hoop skills so she loved to show anybody that would watch her hula hoop skills. Detectives were able to piece together what happened to Carol on the day that she went missing. Carol had been abducted six days earlier while walking to the 7-Eleven gas station. Carol's older sister lived across the hall from them in another apartment, and she was 24 at the time. Carol's older sister would give Carol $5 and convince her to go to the 7-Eleven to buy some household groceries. The thing is, Carol's mother was very strict. She had eight siblings and her mother had to run a tight ship to keep them all in order. Carol did know that if she went to the store by herself and her mom found out that she was going to get hit with either a switch or a bell or something along the lines. I do want to say that this took place in the 1970s, so discipline then is a bit different than how maybe we discipline children today. As Carol is walking to the 7-Eleven, which was only a couple blocks from her home, she runs into her mother. And Carol's mother says, listen, you go to the store, you get the items, and you go directly home. And we're going to discuss this, obviously, when I get home. But the little girl, who wasn't even 5 feet tall and 100 pounds, never returned home. Carol's mother quickly realized that Carol hadn't returned home. So Carol's mother, her children, the neighbors, they all began looking for Carol. But unfortunately, they couldn't find her. So Carol's mother would file a missing persons report. After Carol's body was recovered and examined, they would soon realize that she had been strangled and sodomized. She had cuts on her face, her neck, her chest, and both hands. Her nose was bloodied. They were able to locate green synthetic fibers on the clothing of Carol. When Carol was found on that Saturday, she was wearing the same blue gym shorts, red sweater, and brown socks on that she was last seen wearing but the medical examiner would find citrus in her stomach. The detective on the case, Romaine Jenkins, theorized that the killer had kept Carol alive for a few days. And authorities believe that Carol had only been dead for two or three days when they found her at that point. They would retrace the little girl's steps and the 7-Eleven clerk told them that she was there, she did get her merchandise and she left. At the same time, a 14 year old was on the way to that same store with her mother and sister and also saw Carol with the groceries. So sometime between when Carol left the 7-Eleven and was walking home just a couple of blocks, she was abducted. Unfortunately, 10 weeks later, the killer would strike again. An employee of the DC Department of Highway and Traffic was having car trouble and pulled over to the side of the road on 295. When he got out of his car, he saw a body and he would immediately call the police. Apparently, that had been the second call police had gotten that day about this body. Except when police were sent to the scene, they never got out of their cars. They just drove by and didn't see the body. They never got out of their cars to look for the remains or anything of the sort, which is just completely shocking to me. I'm not sure how you get a call as an officer for a dead body, and then you don't go look for the dead body that you've been called about. It's part of your job. 
And then a week later, on July 19th, one of the callers who had originally called about the dead body returned to the scene to make sure that the police actually went there. But to his disgust, the body was still there, and it was rotting in the heat. This man was furious over the police inaction, so he told his boss what happened. So his boss would go, he would drive over to confirm that there was a body there, and then he would call a close friend of his. And this friend of his was a DC police sergeant. Police Sergeant Charles Baden was off duty that day, and he would later go on to say, he told me exactly where it was on the freeway opposite 295, just north of Bowling Air Force Base. I asked him if he called police and he said, yeah, but nobody came. So Charles Baden rode his motorcycle over and confirmed that there was a body. I just can't even begin to imagine a police department getting a call about a dead body and not fully investigating. And then a week later getting another call about the same body just laying there is absolutely disgusting and just a failure on their part. A second body was discovered only 15 feet away from where Carol had been discarded. The victim was a 16-year-old girl named Arlena Johnson. She had been reported missing on July 9th. The young girl was on her way to work at a recreational center and she was planning to stay the night there because there was a big sleepover for a bunch of little kids. So she had to watch them and make sure the sleepover went well. Unfortunately, this young girl would never make it to work that day. This young, beautiful, intelligent, had her whole life ahead of her little girl, was found 11 days later. Her body so badly decomposed because of the elements and the fact that police didn't respond quick enough. She was so decomposed that the medical examiner had to cut off a finger just to identify her. They couldn't determine how she died, but we can assume had they taken the first two or three calls seriously, maybe they would have been able to tell those things. They would have been able to know how she died. They might have found evidence, but they didn't take the call seriously. Nine days after this discovery, another body would be found. This time, the body was found just across the district line on Route 50 in Cheverly. The victim was a 10-year-old girl known as Brenda Faye Crockett. And as you can see from her picture, she has the cutest dimples. She was from Washington where she had tons of friends. People just absolutely adored her. She was just a sweet and loving little girl. She loved to post her pictures and she loved her church. Like many of the other little girls, Brenda had left her home, curlers still in her hair, to go to the Safeway. She needed to buy bread and pet food for the family's three dogs. Her mom sent her out around 8 p.m., but she thought her daughter, Brenda, had taken a friend with her. When the little girl didn't return after an hour, her mother became frantic and began to look for her. Her mother's boyfriend stayed behind with Brenda's little sister, Bertha, who was seven at the time. At around 9.20 p.m., the phone rang, and the little voice on the other end had a startling message for the family. The caller on the other end was Brenda, and she said that a white man snatched her and took her to Virginia. But she did say that this man was sending her home in a taxi before hanging up. Bertha remembers that her sister was crying, and she would call back 25 minutes later and talk to her mother's boyfriend. The boyfriend would say, where are you? Do you know in Virginia where you are? The little girl would say, no, did my mother see me? And he would say, how could your mother see you if you're in Virginia? The mother's boyfriend would say, put this man on the phone. And the little girl would whisper, well, I'll be seeing you before hanging up. Her body was found less than eight hours later. And detectives quickly realized that her bare feet had been pristine, meaning somebody must have cleaned them. The little girl had been strangled and raped. And like Carol, they were able to uncover green synthetic fibers on her clothing. The detective on the case who was first on the scene would say that he remembers everything so vividly. He would note that he had to put plastic bags on her tiny hands. He would note that he had to put tiny bags on her little hands to preserve evidence before loading her up in a little bag to take her to the morgue. This time the killer did something different. He had a little girl call home. And detectives were wondering why he hadn't done this before, not to their knowledge. Was Brenda able to get to the phone to call her family, or had he forced her to call her family? Detective Jenkins has a theory about this. She said that perhaps the killer knew Brenda's family, specifically Brenda's mother, and wanted to make sure that the mother hadn't seen him abducting the little girl. 
Jenkins would go on to say, why would you let her call home? Not once, but twice. He had to make sure that the mother didn't see her, which means that he had to be awfully close to that neighborhood. He must have known the mother. He must have known who her children were. Maybe he lived in the neighborhood and was comfortable there. Something seems really strange about that phone call. On October 1st, 1971, Nanoma Shia Yates, who was 12 at the time, had gone to the Safeway, which was a block away from her family home. It was around 7 p.m. and she had a list with her. She needed sugar and flour and paper plates. Her stepmother had just had a baby, so Yates' father was staying behind with the stepmother to help with the baby. Unfortunately, the little girl would vanish on her way home. Two hours later, a 16-year-old boy would find her still warm body along Pennsylvania Avenue. The little sixth grader had been strangled and raped. And like the two other cases, detectives found that green synthetic fiber on her clothing. Six weeks later, a fifth victim was found. Brenda Woodward, who was 18 at the time, had been missing since November 15th. Brenda had been attending night classes to hone her typing and shorthand skills. And typically, the classmate that she was with that evening would drive her home, but his car was in the shop, so they took the bus together. They would first stop at Ben's Chili Bowl and get something to eat, and then they would hop on their buses and go their separate ways. A police officer would discover Brenda Woodward's body. Brenda was just south of Route 202 near Prince George's Hospital. It was about 5 a.m. the next morning after she went missing. The officer would go on to say in a later interview, I shine my flashlight into her eyes to see if there was life. She didn't blink. She didn't do anything. Her burgundy velvet coat was draped over her. Her black turtleneck was inside out and buttons were missing from her coat and her skirt. She had been raped, strangled, and stabbed four times. There was defensive wounds on her hands and police knew that she fought viciously for her life. And then they would recover a note from the killer. The note was written in pencil and stuffed inside her pocket. It would read, This is tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me if you can. Signed, Freeway Phantom. Authorities were actually positive that Brenda Woodward wrote the note herself. Obviously, the killer told her what to write and she was forced to write it. The FBI would match that writing to other samples of Brenda's and they concluded that she was forced to write this note. And they noted that it looked like her normal handwriting. It was punctuated properly. It didn't look like she was shaking. And they wondered if she had known her killer. Detective Jenkins would go on to say, There were no signs that she was nervous when she wrote that note. You don't think calmly like that if someone has kidnapped and assaulted you. Ten months would go by until the next murder. On September 6, 1972, the body of Diane Williams, a 17-year-old girl, was found by a trucker. On the night that she went missing, she had spent the night with her boyfriend, who had walked her to the bus stop. She had been strangled and left along I-295, about 200 yards south of the DC line. Diane was written on one of her white shoes, and a dollar twenty-six was still in her pocket. In 1974, the FBI would become involved with this case, and they would come across a prime suspect. Their prime suspect became Robert Askins. He was a computer technician, but had served time for poisoning a DC sex worker. He was freed in 1958 after his sentence was overturned due to a technicality. In March of 1977, police would obtain a search warrant to search this man's home. Inside his home, they found the appellate court's opinion from his conviction, which used the word tantamount, the same word that was used in that note that was found in Woodward's pocket and it would become known that Askins used that word often when he was trying to stress the importance of his work or something like that. They would also find soiled women's scarves, photos of girls and young women, a knife that was used in another crime, and an essay from a girl. About a month later, they would search his car, and they would find two buttons and an earring under the seats. But they couldn't find where those green synthetic fibers came from. In fact, they really didn't have any evidence of him being the killer of these six girls. Several years after these phantom freeway murders, he would receive a life sentence for kidnapping and raping of two women, and he would later die in prison. A detective who visited the case in 2009 said that he firmly believed that this killer lived in the neighborhood, specifically somewhere around the first two victims, and that's because they were abducted within blocks of each other. And he basically said that the killer would have to go outside of his home for the other victims because the police weren't watching, but the neighborhood was. You really couldn't get away with much there because the neighbors were always outside and talking and hanging out and spending time together. So they would become suspicious of this person. 
The detectives believe this person was 20 or 30 and was a black male who was probably in the neighborhood of the first two victims. Although Brenda Faye Crockett said a white man snatched her up, this could have been a red herring to throw police off his trail. An FBI profiler would say that this person was probably a high school graduate and had an average or above average intelligence. They said that he was probably employed and knew how to start conversations with women and have conversations, but couldn't really maintain healthy relationships with them. They said he either lived alone or with an older woman in the neighborhood. In 1987, Romaine Jenkins would reopen this case where she was assigned to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and now she had the resources to investigate it the way it should have been all those years ago. She had everybody working on the case turn over their notebooks, she revisited crime scenes, she talked to families and neighbors and friends, anybody she could get her hands on, she talked to. She realized that Darlena Johnson's mother had received a phone call, and this was during the time that her daughter was missing. Diane's parents also received a call, and the killer said to them, I killed your daughter. Police determined that Darlena Johnson was probably with her boyfriend, before she vanished. But the boyfriend's mother refused to let him talk to the police. DNA testing, which didn't exist in 1970, was now available. The only problem was law enforcement did not do a good job preserving the evidence from the crime scenes. Apparently now, nobody knows where the evidence is for these cases. There's so much wrong with this case. I feel like it was completely botched. And I know when I was doing my research, a lot of people talked about the fact that this was 1970 and these were black girls and women that were missing and it wasn't taken serious enough. I do feel like they should have done better. One little girl was out there for an entire week before they even located the body, although they had calls about that. Just feels like they could have done so much more to prevent some of these deaths. I'm not sure I have a theory per se, but I do believe the killer lived in the neighborhood and knew some, if not all, of these families. So I'd love to know your thoughts on the case. Do you have theories? Have you done a deep dive? Let me know. But that's it for today, guys. If you like this video or any other video on my channel, be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss video upload. If there's a case you'd like me to cover, pop it in the comments below and I'll be sure to get to it. In the meantime, check out some other videos on my channel while you wait for the next upload, and I'll see you then.